So scientists are interested in more than simply classifying animals in groups. They're also interested in seeing the evolutionary relationships that exist between them, and that's why they use taxonomy less today, and they use phylogeny a little bit more. So instead of putting animals just in groups, they use phylocodes, or the path that they have to take in the tree of life to get to a certain animal to actually classify animals and differentiate them from others. And another thing that they add to the trees of life is proportional limb lengths to actually tell you information about how long a certain type of animal has existed for and how long ago did that species differentiate from other species that which from which they have common ancestors with and this is a process that we call molecular clocking or the process of creating a tree of life that actually includes the history of life within it in terms of the timing of the evolutionary process so here you see an example of such a tree of life that has a lot of information about the life forms and for example it talks about stromatolites which are one of the earliest uh, life forms to actually be fossilized. It comes from all the way from the Precambrian time. You have some dinosaurs that exist around uh, 200 million years to 65 million years ago including the really cool Pliosaurus uh, and you also have the Di the Metrodon, which is an ancient reptile uh, from the end of the Permian period. Um, you also have ammonites and other reptiles from even before then. And so these dinosaurs and reptiles and other kinds of fossils give us information about when those animals used to live. And you can actually use things like the fossil record, like sedimentation layers, um, like uh, and the rates that it takes for the sediments to form, ice cores, tree rings, uh, radiocarbon dating, if it's a recent specimen, or if it's a longer specimen, you can use uranium dating, all of these things to tie to date the rocks in which the fossils are found. But there's also a biological way of doing this. You can do what we call molecular clocking, and this is a process of using the actual DNA mutation rate to actually try to figure out how long the uh, changes have occurred or taken place in the animal. And it's based on that concept that we talked about in the last video with paralogous and orthologous genes because paralogous genes will basically indicate that how much difference there is between two animals uh, because, or two organisms because one organism will be the original and then some organisms will be very similar to the original but other ones will be what we call mutant types instead of the wild type. Now this mutant type will have a little bit of change when compared to this original type. So now you have, you're going to have what you call a differentiation between the, two, the species and you're going to have two versions of a certain gene. And by comparing how different these genes are, you can try to figure out how long ago these this animals split from each other. And for example, if we look at us and the genes of, that exist in the or other simian species or ape species, you can try to figure out how long ago it's been since us and those species have had a common ancestor. And because we share so much in common, but some of our genes are going to be different, and that's going to be some of the information that we need. Sometimes also, of course, you're also going to have some animals which have different genes, and in, within the genome of the same species. For example, you're going to have genes which are going to be present more than once in a genotype. So for example, when, that's when you have a gene that underwent duplication and you have two copies of the gene in the genotype. We're going to call that orthologous genes. And these orthologous genes with two copies of each in, in, a, in a genotype, you may have one copy that's actually similar to the original copy and then you have another copy that's like a mutation of that copy. And because you have two versions of the gene within your genotype, that's going to lead to more variation. We talked about this in the last video. And the idea is that you're going to have things like multifactorial traits, like skin color for, or eye color or hair curl, because there are so many different genes coding for similar traits, and they're, but they're going to be different from each other, and they're all within the, 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 the genome because of successive duplication and mutation events that led to to repetition of the gene within the genome followed by mutations of one or but not the other or mutations on several different strands of the gene and that can also be used for comparison sake and if you compare the differences that exist between your orthologous genes you can also try to figure out um, you know how how much how long ago your species have been evolving this particular pattern
And you can also compare that with other paralogous genes to figure out the same process. So scientists use look at the DNA library that we discussed in the last video, and they look at the amount of difference that exists to try to figure out uh, how to clock a certain age of a certain organism. So how do we actually get go from understanding this DNA library process to actually clocking it? Well, the idea is that you should know how long it takes for certain types of mutations to gather because we understand how the genetic mechanisms that of gene expression to take place. In other words, if you see a protein, you know how long it takes for this protein to be made, you know how this protein is made, and you also know, you know the DNA upon which this protein is based on. So you can do coding for both the protein sequences and the DNA sequences with things like western blotting, northern blotting, and cDNA analysis and things like that, which we learned when we talked about biotechnology. We also learned about when we did protein synthesis and DNA expression and DNA synthesis process that there are mistakes that sometimes happen during the DNA synthesis process or the application process. DNA polymerase is not perfect at laying down the bricks or nucleotides in with the correct base pairing rules. And which is why you have excision repair enzymes or proofreading enzymes that come through afterwards to double check the spelling on the DNA code to make sure it was done appropriately. But we also know that that process is not 100% perfect and that sometimes mutations will actually be left. But most of the times those mutations will happen in areas of the DNA which are non-coding regions or usually they're going to be junk DNA or even orthologous genes which have copies which are no longer functional anyways. And so those genes are what we call, we call silent and they will mutate very, very fast because since they don't affect the phenotype at all, they cause no uh, selection advantage or disadvantage so they can randomly mutate without us ever realizing that they're even mutating which is why if you compare different people's DNA you're going to see so many different uh, variations of the of the non-coding DNA regions because um, two different families will have a lot of differences between them because they have large rates of mutation on the non-coding regions since they don't exact, exactly change the phenotype but other mutations will actually occur in coding regions of the DNA and they will actually be expressed sometimes, although sometimes they're not because of things like diplody, epistasis, plagiopy, uh, and multifactorial traits and other types of advanced genetic relationships. It's going to mask the result of that mutation. And so sometimes that will slow down the selection process like we talked about when we did the, the population genetics lecture series. But when deportation is actually expressed and present in the population, it may give the animal an advantage or disadvantage, at which point selection is going to take place and, you know, select for or against that. If it is the disadvantage straight, that mutation will probably be immediately deleted or deleted over a long period of time, as long as it is not uh, associated with another essential type of, of gene and, or trait, in the case of a platopic gene, and therefore, it, it will disappear from, from the code. But if it's, it's a beneficial mutation, then it will take hold of the population over many, many, many generations, especially if random effects or selection effects take place like we talked about in the in evolution lecture series. And we know basically how this process takes place. We know how population genetics works. We know how much the DNA machinery uh, makes mistakes. We know how long it takes for those mistakes to become present in the population. So we, sh we should know the rate of which, at which mutations take for actually to be expressed in the population and the rate at which mutations gather based on all its understanding of modern genetics and molecular genetics. And so based on our comparison of DNA libraries and understanding about the way the machinery of evolution and genetics works, we can actually calculate the rate at which two animals must have evolved away from each other. So for example, let's say two animals share a common ancestor and you try to compare the differences or similarities that exist in the code between those two animals. So here an example on the left side you see a chart that represents the, the amino acid differences between two animals. Animals which are, say for example, 90% different from each other are going to be, according to this chart, sharing a common ancestor around 420 million years ago. And that kind of makes sense because if you uh, have a, uh, so many differences, it probably is because you have been evolving away from each other for a very, very long time. So this is an example of divergent evolution making the, the organisms so different from each other. But if you have 50% of your genes about the same, then you will see that this animal or groups or this pair was probably 280 million years ago that they actually had a common ancestor.
If it's something like 10%, then it's probably something less than 100 million years ago, closer to 70 or 50 million years ago. So you see that you can use uh, this rate of mutation to create a slope of the graph that can be used to estimate the degree of differences that exist between t any two given organisms. And the way the scientists do it is that they examine the, the DNA similarities or the protein uh, sequence similarities among several different animals. And they look at several different genes all at once in order to actually create a chart that determines the rate at which evolution pro usually takes place. And then you can take that chart and extrapolate the dates of, of, of which the animals probably differentiated from each other. Well, of course, this is not going to be perfect because there's a lot of uh, problems with using this system. One of the major problems that you have is that um, the evolution necessarily uh, is exactly always at this, happening at the same rate. So you're going to need to compare this with things like the fossil record, uh, uh, carbon dating, or uranium dating, or other kinds of radioactive dating. You're going to need to look at tree rings, ice cores, and other kinds of climatological evidence, as well as geological evidence such as the fossil record and the sedimentation of layers and other types of evidence. Put all of that together to actually see if there's a large degree of agreement between dating with different methods. And the thing is that there is, and so we're pretty sure that even if we are a little bit off, we're not going to be millions and millions of years off. It's going to be just a tiny percentage off. But so that means this is an excellent way for biologists to compare it to different animal groups. You can see, for example, in this graph, it's saying that the, the most recent metazoan ancestor that includes all the types of animals, that derived character developed between 634 and 687 million years ago according to the, to the record of, of the technology of molecular clocking. And you can get a more accurate, precise measurement if you, of, or a narrowing of this range if you actually also look at other types of evidence like fossil records and other the evidences that we also mentioned. Notice that the most recent eukaryotic ancestor varies between 644 and 987 million years ago. So you see how you can use this to actually track the differences or the timing of the rife characters in a tree of life, and then you can create a tree of life that has branches which have lengths that have pre represent the, the, the time frames for the development of that particular group of the tree of life or that clod of the tree of life. So that's how a scientist developed several different groups of displacement or time periods for the development of organisms, which we discussed when we did the origin of life earlier in the year. Um, and we're going to continue from here in the next last video. We're going to talk about how scientists actually use molecular clocking and what are some of the advantages and disadvantages of using this clocking mechanism. I'll see you guys then.